Welcome to the Habits and Hustle podcast, a podcast that uncovers the rituals, unspoken habits, and mindsets of extraordinary people. A podcast powered by Habit Nest. Now here's your host, Jennifer Cohen. I have the uh, global international parenting expert uh, galore, uh, Joe Frost, otherwise known as a super nanny. You're in your eighth season of doing the show on Lifetime, correct? Yes. That's yes. Correct. <laughs> and um, I think that your information right now, especially what we're going through, we're kind of like, we're kind of getting out of the woods right now with this pandemic, with the COVID-19 lockdown, but still it's been a trying time for anybody who's a parent. Or and not. Or I mean, not, I was going to say, or not. We're all doing this for the first time, right? Absolutely. That's absolutely a good point. Um, I will say, though, uh, for those who are parents, it's, it's, very, it's been extremely difficult to work and also homeschool and have everybody like contained in a very lot, a lot of times in a small impact. Not perfect picture. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is why I'm, I'm actually very happy to have you on, uh, this podcast, Habits and Hustle, because we have a lot, I'm sure a lot of people are, are struggling with this. So the first question I have is, how, how, what, what, and God, how are we, <laughs> what, I, I've got so many questions. Uh, what are we, what are we supposed to do? Like, you know what I, the big joke is we keep on saying, if the coronavirus won't kill you, homeschooling will, right? <laughs> We're not. I mean, I, I was a bad student in school as it was. I could barely understand my child's like, you know, first grade homework. How are we supposed to be effective parents and also do our job while keeping our kids entertained? What you come back to is the importance of understanding what you do have rather than what you don't have. At the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We are in a crisis trying to homeschool the best we can, not homeschool, right? Mm -hmm. And for all of those parents who are homeschooling and have homeschooled for many years, they'll know that the president's very different with respect to the hours that they are focused on doing that schoolwork and the other outlets that build the curriculum for homeschooling the many children they do have. But yes, it did hit us seven weeks with how am I going to create this ideal picture that becomes a reality for me of meeting a hundred percent in every box. And the simple truth is you can't. Right. You you can't meet a hundred percent and check off every box. It's not possible. But what you can do is come to a place instead of beating yourself up is a reality of what you can do and to do the best that you can under a structure that does facilitate you doing the best you can with respect to the homeschooling and the assignments you are being given. To understand that you are not your children's entertainer puppeteer and that. For you to have this time at home where you can take an opportunity to come around the dining table together and have breakfasts and lunches and meal times, which let's face it was a lost art for many families Mm -hmm. who were working because they never prioritized as such, is now something that can be put in with recognizing also your children's body clock. So for younger children, you know, they wake up like most of us, hopefully with a good night's sleep of being more sprightly and ready to learn. And there's a reason why those schools hit the creative stuff in the afternoon, because our body peaks, as you know. You know, it has those peak performance times and moments when um, you don't. And so I think it's important to be able to recognize, number one, you're not going to hit 100% on every box. Number two, that doing your best is good enough in how you fit in your children's assignments and what you realistically can do. And then to also recognize that on any given day, you're not going to be able to keep every kid happy at every moment. You know, I think we can set ourselves up with expectations 
to spin a thousand plates in a culture um, that rewards a mother, a father that does as such. You know, that old saying, wow, guess what? She's, you know, she's spinning 30 plates over there. Yeah, but, but look at her. She, yeah. you know, mother looks drained. She looks tired. She has no patience. She's now resorted to yelling at her kids. She's getting no sleep. She's put herself on the back burner. She's trying to keep everybody happy and no one's happy because she's not even happy at all in what she's doing. And there's a re- there's there's a realness about that. You know, there's there's the reality of a circumstance that's uncharted waters and the you know re- the realistic expectations that we put on ourselves as parents. Period. That's a good why is it that um, in this in today's time it's all about overscheduling your kids, right? And to feel like you're you're doing a good job as a parent or to feel like you're a, a good parent, you have to kind of put your kids' schedule is like overscheduled and you have to be giving them so many activities, so many different like external things to to kind of busy them. Where it's, the narrative that, it's the narrative that got sold in this country. You know, we, we see it everywhere, media outlets, parenting magazines. You are a wonderful parent. You're the best parent. How to make your kids succeed, how to make them really happy. Mm-hmm. You know, the billion-dollar parenting enterprise, right, of, of um, <laughs> the trickery, right, of mm-hmm. feeling that you're doing the best by your child if you can do X, Y, and Z for them. And the reality is, is that, The simplest of things are what allows you to connect to your children and bring the most uncomplicated things that are happy, you know, for you as a family, you know, being productive in the morning and and getting up and, you know, making your bed is the first task in the morning, you know, understand the importance of of providing free steady meals and a couple of snacks in between is making a conscious decision to eat well as a family, to be active, to be moving, you know, to do things together, to to understand the importance of sleep. And yet, let's face it, we're a hustled country. You know, we go a thousand miles an hour. Right now, Mother Nature has said to us, stop, you better breathe because I'm taking a breath right now. And this is not to minimize, and I've said this to many people, this is not to minimize the pandemic that is happening and what we are going through right now. But I do hope, as somebody that has spent 30 years inside families' homes around the world, I truly do hope for one moment this is bringing us closer to some profound realization of what truly is important to our family? Mm-hmm. What truly is a priority? And what has made us happier since we have been by government, state, country in lockdown? What have I valued? What have I invested in? What did I do that actually has made me feel more content as a parent raising my kids? I notice my teenager is happier. I feel like my younger one's learning more life skills. So I hope this is a moment of being able to recognize that none of this time is wasted. We're not just existing to get through the pandemic, but actually this is a very, this is a very, you know, pint glass full rather than unfull moment for for many families, you know, and if we can continue to, B, I would say in gratitude, right, to practice. Like I say to many families, it's the consistency of something that we do and understanding what we need to do to provide that consistency that leads to us feeling that that was a success for us, however you define success. So, you know, families may say to me, well, you know, we're not really getting enough sleep. We're sleep deprived. But a lot of families were sleep deprived before this pandemic. So what do we need to do within our structure, our daily routine, to make it a priority of us getting the sleep that we need so that we're able to, in a healthy manner, 
not just enjoy the day, but to also allow us to be in a space where mentally, where we are providing what is well for our family. Because we know, even scientifically, that sleep is the number one priority in any form of health for any family and what the yeah. detriments of that what the detriments of that is for any so- So why don't we start, let's talk about structure, because I'm a big fan of that, right, for myself and for my kids. And from a very young age, I I thought that putting them on a routine and a structure makes kids feel safe and kind of keeps things in line, right? How do people start building a structure that's sustainable and that actually, um, that they can actually work day to day? Because I feel like that's kind of where things begin to kind of spiral out of control when you don't have that. It, so believe it, steps? It, it's true, believe it or not, most people you would think know how to, to make a daily routine because to some degree we have right. a daily routine, whether it right. serves us or not. We do have some right. form of, of a routine, a pattern, whatever that is. Right, for right. Most, for most families, it's dictated around um, the school, the cornerstones, what I call the cornerstones that become we. Right, they're the cornerstones of how we together are functioning as a family and meeting the needs and the priorities of each individual child, whatever their age is. So, you know, we take a look at that. So, are we a family with teenagers and younger children? Do we have children at home um, or are they at school? And based on those that have external um, circumstances, whether it's scheduling or school. And we start to create the cornerstones. So whatever time school starts, one needs to recognize what needs to happen before that. And you start to work backwards. So I do this a lot with many families that I've been helping on the Super Nanny show. As you know, I've been filming around America doing season eight. And they say- It's in 300 countries, right? You're in 300 countries. I believe the Super Nanny show alone, I've got six different shows, but and they're all over the world. But I believe Super Nanny is in now 149 territories around the world. So we're in six continents. Oh, wow. Yeah, I saw a number like 300 countries. It must be a combination of all these other things that you're doing. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're everywhere, yeah. I want to ask you about that it's afterwards. It takes a team of us. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, I'm curious about that, but finish about the schedule, how people can like start to build so, a, a so healthy schedule. With, you know, start with the cornerstones. You know, it's when the children have school. What kind of um, curriculum do they have with outside activities? Um, working backwards from those pin cornerstones. So, you know, if our children have to be out the door um, by 8.30 to be at school by 9, then what does that mean as far as getting dressed, preparation, organization, breakfast, and working backwards to the time that they would be waking up? And then we go backwards even more because based on their age, we want to support the amount of sleep that they need, whether that's 12 hours, 10 hours, 8 hours. And that sets the parameter for the night before in what time the children should be going to bed. So already we've top and tailed a routine. Mm -hmm. And the filler becomes when the children are home and the meal times. So a consistent meal time for most families will create, you know, blood sugar level keeping on an even kill. Um, it won't allow mothers to get to that four o'clock crunch of a cup of tea and a few pieces of chocolate and something <laughs> sweet, right? Or kids, kids' temperaments, you know, and, and um, should I say undesired behavior because you cut the toast in squares rather than triangles, right. you know, because they weren't given... Um, you know, meal times that really supported um, their body clock as such, you know? Yeah, there, yes. um, so again, with the structure of, of a meal times, the structure of the external classes, schooling, um, and uh, with so we are able to fit in based on age, um, early learning, um, early learning games and toys to do with young in the morning, um, mime and nursery and music in the afternoon. Um, and creative and art stuff, um, as well as making sure that our kids are out, outdoors and moving. So if we think about the pandemic now and homeschooling and having um, a moment to do work and to 
uh, make sure that our kids are getting at least a couple of hours in of doing homeschooling. Again, what we would see is we would substitute the homeschool um, for the place where we would be at school. So we can get our kids up having had a good night's sleep. You know, we've prepared and organized what they're going to wear in the morning. Um, what we create is more self-discipline. And I think really with any anything, and I know uh, talking to yourself and an expert in your own field, that anything that we do that's consistent starts with this muscle first. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you just said something. I, I feel like a big theme with this podcast and a lot what a lot of people talk about and they mention, especially a lot of high performers, people who've succeeded and all sorts of things. It's always, it's not about, it, beca- it comes down to one thing and it's discipline and self-discipline. And, um, and I think it all starts with that. And how do you start that? How do you start to ingrain that in a young child? How do you start? Besides, I think a schedule like we talked about. Productivity. Being productive and having a ritual, you know, and having a ritual. I've had my grandson here for the last two months. Um, How old is he? He's coming up to six. Okay. Yeah, my daughter's five, so it's perfect. So he's just coming up to six. He's just shy of being six years old. Um, and you know, he's been into a routine here. If you know, he gets up, he makes his bed. That's the first task done, you know, and then he's washing hands and brushing teeth and getting dressed and coming to the table and we're having breakfast together. There is gratitude that we have, you know, with Papa and Nanny Joe and himself. We talk about what we're thankful for, for the day over breakfast, what we're going to be in gratitude for. So, you know, there's, there's rituals and they're baby steps because, it's not given to all of us. We build that. We're not given a big sack of willpower. We're not given a big abundance of determination. We just take one step. We just take one step forward and say, today we did it. And tomorrow we'll do it. And the next day we'll do it. And it's being realistic with how much you bite off. Because if you try to over-accomplish Again, you can sabotage yourself. So it's being realistic with what you can do. Start off with just a few, just a few steps. And I have families who, you know, in the first day become, you know, very overconfident. And you wouldn't think that I'd use that word of overconfidence, but they're like, right now I want to go five steps. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You, You wouldn't try and make a baby run, would you, before they could stand up? So again, it's being realistic with just baby steps and the practice and the ritual of being able to do that. If you lead by example, children have a wonderful way of making you have to stand up and do things, even if you're hearing that voice saying, I could really do with another half an hour in bed, Right. right? And it's when you're leading by example, you recognize very clearly that that's an opportunity to keep going, even if it's for their sake at that moment, it does you good as well. Right. You know, for families that are taking walks right now in their daily routine, you know, some families may be feeling, you know, I'm really tired right now. And to do a three and a half mile walk for an hour, maybe, you know, something I could do without. But again, you're leading the example and there are many benefits of being able to do that. And you'll feel really good once you've done it. And I mean really good meaning. You'll be proud of yourself that you've done it. You might not physically feel good because not everything we do or any change that we make feels great in the beginning. Sometimes it feels really shitty, you know, and most people will tell you if, you know, they're trying to keep themselves fit or they're trying to, you know, work on every day, having a new pattern, a ritual. It doesn't feel that brilliant in the beginning. Sometimes it really feels like tough. And, it, you know, it would be easier to go back to the old blanket you've been used to. But it's taking just that baby step forward and being realistic that if we take bite sizes of what we do, we can then just add, add, small, small. But again, we live in a world that wants to sell us immediate gratification. We are sold by commercials that say to us, we can lose 50 pounds in three weeks. And why don't you do this? And hey, your children will be, you know, doing this in one day. And we're not being real with the reality. It took you how long 
to be in this situation, it's going to take you some moments to get into that swing of the practice to resolve. So that's, I like that. So um, what age is too young or what, or to start with um, baby steps of teaching someone innate discipline? At what age can you start that process? I think we do it from a young age. What age? With, with Three, I think five, we do. Or? I think we do it from a young. I think we do it from the beginning with, um, you know, with children past that first. You know, from nine to ten months. I think we're beginning to teach our children already. You know, oh, that age. okay, God, really young. If you okay. think about it, we're saying we're distracting our children from touching certain things from having a little bit more patience when they throw things over the high chair, we bring it back again and say, leave that here. Let's read a book and you eat this here. So I think, again, we start from a very young age, not being very conscious of the fact that we're doing that. When we get to 18 months and 20 months, we're like, I pick one brick up, you pick another brick up. Come on, let's help mommy and we'll tidy up. But daddy's going to take the stuff out, you take that sock and I'll take that one. So I think we do it from a very young age in getting our kids involved and getting them very productive and the small little things that they can do that benefit them in a very fun learning way, you know? Yeah, yeah, I like that. I feel like um, what I feel happens a lot, you know, even with all this stuff that, you know, I try to practice more or less. I mean, obviously, sometimes more, sometimes less. I yeah. feel like I, people, myself, and other people say all the time when I was when I actually was going to I knew I was having you on I was asking friends of mine questions like what do you think I should ask the super you know Joe Frost the super nanny yeah. um, kids don't listen I have to repeat myself over and over and over again to get a kid to get my kids to actually listen uh, it's it's that repet it's not first time listening around here or right. a lot of other people but why uh, it fathoms me why any parent feels that their children should listen once. I know. Well, that's why I'm asking you. What do you think? You're the expert. No, I mean, I think it's unrealistic. I'm absolutely fathomed why parents have an expectation to say something once to a small child and think that they would just go off and do it. They're not robots. Like, right. to me, it's, I don't, I, it's totally unreasonable for any parent to think that they would ask a small child to do something and then the child just go off immediately and do so. When I have to teach most parents to talk to their children's face because they ask things to the back of their head. The child will be playing and they'll be like, oh, Charlotte, can you go and put that over there, please? <laughs> did, did you just talk to Charlotte's back of her head? Uh, or the mom's, you know, the mom will be in the kitchen. She'll be like, Tommy, come in now. It's dinner time. Yes. <laughs> I want a megaphone with that. Oh, That's so true. When children are really little, what's most important is that interaction and communication face to face, you know, right. so that we have clear communication they can. They need to obviously sharpen their auditorial skills through the practice. But what happens is that parents don't even realise they're talking to the back of their children's heads. Their children are focused on what they're playing. They give them a time to finish and think that they're just going to finish on their own when no young child is going to finish on their own. Um, they're going to wait because they're there focused, enjoying what they're doing. Um, and I use something called the speaking clock which gives a sort of time breakdown. So if you, you know, if your children were playing with something and it was going to be meal time, you would go into the room, call their name, have them look up and then say to them, you know, in 10 minutes, I'm going to come back and let you know that you need to come to the table, wash your hands um, because it's going to be dinner time. And what happens is that parents don't do that. They get lazy, they shout, they talk to the back of the head. And then what happens is they yell. And when they yell, they startle the child because, and I have to say, I'm glad for this, but not for the yelling. Parents are seeking in thinking, my word, you know, it's taboo for me to smack, which I'm hoping parents are understanding 
not going to get you anywhere, outdated practice. And so they yell. But as soon as they yell, you look, you look mad. You look frantic. You're like, <laughs> right? You startle the child. They look up at you and you're like, get to the room now. And they're like, what? And then that's how they learn. And that's how you learn to only get a response from your child when you've raised your voice and when you've gone to that place. That's the only time then you get a response from them. And so I spend time weaning the parent back as in clear communication first, speaking clock when you are putting a timer on when kids need to wrap things up and transition to the next thing during their day. Like a warning. Like, okay, we're doing no, a warning. A warning for me is definitely a lower tone that's based on undesirable behavior that you want to stop. But speaking clock is in your conversational tone. It's a matter of fact and it's informational. You're going to have dinner now. You know, we're going to have dinner now, guys. Okay. I'm going to come back in 10 minutes. So wrap up what you're doing here. Okay. And then I do want you to go and wash your hands and get yourself ready to come to the table because I'm serving up dinner. So it's more informational. It's using your conversational tone, um, letting them know that in 10 minutes, there will be a wrap up. It will be off time. Next one, you know, um, but parents have got themselves into that place of yelling and that's only when the child responds and, and does as they're okay. told. And so you have to, you have to recognize the behavior patterns of yourself and you have to recourse your own behavior to change your children's behavior. And that's what I observe when I go into a home. I look at the behavior patterns that have been instilled, that have been practiced, that are a ritual now, that are negative to the well-being of the family being in a better space and how it's impacted each child and family member. And then I reverse and untangle, untangle and untangle. Is it, is it possible that like how, once the damage is done like that, right? Where the kid, it's like the like response reward, whatever it is. How is it, how easy or hard is it to change that pattern, especially for an adult, right? Because you're so used to it. It's probably harder for the, for the adult than it is for the child. Um, definitely for a teenager, it can be just as hard. For a young child, they know no different. So it's as easy as you're willing to be committed. So the more you're conscious of it and aware of it, and the more you do it and then go, ha, ah, reset the button. Catch yourself, yeah. And catch yourself being aware and then go, oh, no, no, no. And then again, the quicker you can get into that space of doing that, the quicker the result for you. And that all depends again on the type of person. So I'm sure you, there's so many similarities here because I'm sure you see it with what you know it's going to take when you're consulting and you're driving, you know, certain clients of yours to be in a better space in a, on a health level. What type of personality are you dealing with? Have you met somebody who's quite feisty and combative? Are they quite permissive? And do you feel like they just throw in with the wind and give up? Mm -hmm. Are they passive aggressive? So what type of temperament do you need to kind of give them a little bit of tough love and go, right, come on. And then afterwards, a big cuddle afterwards. Like you have to gauge the type of parent that you're working with and recognize the mini me's right. that follow with yeah, the yeah. children, right? Because those temperaments, DNA is real, you know, and you can see it not just in, children's temperaments and in the DNA, but also in um, their response and reactions to the pattern of behavior that has become habitual for many families. So you do notice that usually the, the kids or mini-me's do, uh, do resemble or take on the uh, personalities of the parents most of the time. The behavior, behavior, patterns, the behavior, the behavior patterns. patterns, they have their own personalities. And when they're given an opportunity to shine and show you their personality, um, it's a lot of fun and it can um, create a lot of humor in circumstances that can be um, very heated and with a lot of friction. Uh, but the temperaments of children 
Um, and the way that they react, um, sometimes you can see mini me's, you can see that mirror reflection, you know, and mums will say to me, oh my God, I feel like I'm dealing with a mini me. I'm yeah. Like, uh, you are. Yeah, exactly. You are. You you are. are. Yeah. So, so then let's go back to that. So you said that you give them that, uh, that the, the clock and you say, okay, 10 minutes in that very matter, it kind of like, you know, uh, casual kind of everyday type of tone. And then what happens in the 10 minute mark when the kids are still playing? What's the next, what do you do then? What's the next step? So you would then go in and based on a, based on a younger age, you would go in and you have to recognize that you're already in a space that's a downward spiral, right? So for, for a younger child, you would then usher them to the table. Okay. Now here's the balance for an older child. Um, it takes you to be able to say, look, here's where we're at. I've asked you to do this. You're completely ignoring me. You know what you need to do. And then you would go in with a warning of, if I don't see any cooperation from you right now, then here's what we'll forfeit for it. Because there is no way we will have enough time to do X, Y, and Z if you're not going to listen and cohere to what we're doing together as a family. However, we never lead with warning or consequence ever. So there has to be, and so many parents make this mistake of applying the application of a consequence, a discipline for unwarranted behavior based on trying to control the child rather than uplifting the child and giving them the guidance that encourages them and praises them for coming to the table and for listening and for doing very well and for prompting and praising unprompted behavior as well as prompted behavior. So parents go to the place of negativity. Well, when can I start the naughty step? Because my child's not listening to me. No, let's not worry about going to a place of controlling a child through what they're going to lose and what the forfeit's going to be. Let's praise them and encourage them for how cooperative they have been and the skill set that they have learned and how kind it was for them to have shared their toys today. So there has to be the yin yang. You cannot go in with the, I want to take, take, take away, take away, put them on the naughty step, lose privilege of this. Because otherwise what you create with children is what I call lifer mentality. You're in for life. So what you got to lose? What you got to lose? If you take everything away from somebody, what have they got to lose? What is there to gain? So first and foremost, you have to be a parent that I would say certainly is open and willing to learn much, to read, to learn, to observe. And the pandemic has given us this wonderful opportunity, not just to do every day, get some schoolwork done, have some fun with the kids, play some games, go outside, get some fresh air, sit down, watch a movie together, have a conversation that you haven't had and you needed to have with your partner. But it's given us an opportunity to observe. It's given us an opportunity to sit back a moment while we're at home and actually just watch our kids. And to watch what they're saying as well as what they're not saying, how they interact with one another, what telltale signs do you see, so that we really can build our intuition as parents mm. and listen to that innate voice, because that's where the real confidence comes from, when we can sit back and observe. And a lot of my, my early years in, in childcare comes from not just doing and being in the field of experiencing with hundreds of families and different types of children all around the world of different status, but to actually observe, to watch behavior, to study the behavior, because we all have a pattern and some of us are creature comforts, you know, and yeah. some of us like the old furry slippers and that little comfortable jacket, you know, even if it's no good for us. Yeah, um, and cool. others, are, <laughs> and yeah. others are more, you know, open to fly with the wind, right? So children, right. we get a moment to sit back, which is good for us as well, to give ourselves five. I always say, you will repetitively hear me say, you can't dock out. Hey, kids, I'll be back in 30 minutes. Just go to Starbucks. going to grab a coffee and a panini and I'll see you later. You know, <laughs> that's not for us, right? No, 
it doesn't no. happen for us. But to be able to give yourself permission and say, it's okay. If I, the kids are playing, I actually take 15 minutes. I'm going to put the kettle on. I'm going to make a cup of tea. I'm going to have a coffee. I'm going to look through an article I haven't read or a subscription thing that I wanted to see. And what you do is you look and you look up and you watch and you learn so much from watching. You learn so much about behavior and how two people interact with one another. And that's something I've always done because I look at human behavior. Mm -hmm. I analyze it. I profile it. I study how people behave. You know, it's, I guess, the, the, the sociologist in me, you know, that just watches how children respond or react and how they try and make friends and you know, what happens if you take something away from them based the education that you know with respect to child development. So it's quite an interesting time because we can become closer and more in tune and connected to our children very innately if we spend more time just to observe. Um, there is time in the day to do that. For those single mums that are working from home, they're balanced between looking at a structured routine that will meet the primary cornerstones of their child's life, schooling, mealtimes and playtime, going out, getting to bed on time, alongst doing the work that they can realistically do in an environment and culture that we hope is supporting them because everybody is requiring now to not expect things to be met like they were um, before this pandemic, we have to have a little bit more grace and understanding for those families that are at home and the time, uh, the deadlines being met and the communication of when we can have those meetings and tag team um, and to do the best that we possibly can. It is not the same as what it was before the pandemic. We are having new challenges, new rituals. We are in a new way and in, in the way that we raise our family as working parents or not, um, in this pandemic time, you know. Um, and I think that's important for, for many families to be able to remember. Um, you know, again, this is uncharted waters for myself. But what I am teaching is not the parenting expert in a pandemic, because I've never been through a pandemic like, like everybody else. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, what I am teaching is my expertise in how what this truly has done is created some new circumstances, which is doing the best we can with homeschooling, working from home when we may have been used to going to an office, being around our partners more when we may not have been used to being. Right. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast altogether, right? Right. <laughs> right. do another two hours on that one. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. creating boundaries, right, where we can have space and privacy. But what it is also doing is allowing us to have a moment to, to regulate and to shift and to create new, um, new, new beginnings in a way that I do hope will be uh, more purposeful and meaningful uh, for each individual family because it has to have been a wake up to all of us um, as we were put seven weeks ago in this fight or flight situation of not knowing, you know, how rapidly this virus was traveling across the world. And we've all seen um, the numbers, you know, of, of those who have tragically lost. And this, again, brings us to a space of valuing nothing that's voluntary, everything that's valuable to us as family, as loved ones around us our neighborhoods, our community, um, the empathy, you know, and the compassion and the love in how we will move forward and help one another as much as we can, you know. Um, it requires us. The world is requiring us to look at collectively how we work together and not individualism, me, myself, and I. This is we. This really is collectively we. We as a world, we as a country, we as a community, we as a state, we as a neighbor, you know, we as family and our, you know, and our neighbors too. Um, and I, it wasn't, no, I, you know, it wasn't, I, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't that place, you know? Oh, it's a totally different time. I feel though certain things uh, do stand the test of time. I mean, um, 
especially with the parenting and with kids, certain things doesn't matter. The, pet, the what's happening now only exacerbates a lot of yeah. issues, right? Like an iPad, right? Like every kid is addicted to every child I know is addicted to these to, te- to technology, and now they're forced with being on Zooms and other, you know, to, to learn. How do so you? Here's, so here's the difference there. So before the pandemic. They were there as luxury, you know. If you could afford yeah. an iPad, if you could afford an iPad, you know, a couple of iPads. How many televisions people have in their homes here is always amazes me. It's you amazing, know, isn't it? It's five, amazing. Seven televisions in each room, two in the conservatory. You know, like it's always amazed me how many televisions we, there's. You know, people have got going on and radio and then iPads. You know, like it's technology, unbelievable. technology, so much technology, and. They were thrown in as the crutch, the the electronic babysitter. There already shows out already on season eight of Super Nanny showing and highlighting how iPads were used as electronic babysitters to occupy the children because ultimately what the grassroots issue was, was a parent or parents that were overwhelmed with not having a routine that supported their well-being as they were raising their different ages of children, right? And so it became the crutch. Now we need it as a tool. We need it as a tool for socialization, for our teens and our young ones. For learning. uh, For learning, for education, and which will always remain for its entertainment purposes. And now we really have to take a look at how we use it so that it functions for it being the tool that it is and not for the void that it was filling. So it being there for its true purpose, its true purpose. But there's addiction. I mean, the kids are addicted to these things. How do you you break that addiction? And exactly. They were before. That's what I'm saying. Something this transcend time. It doesn't matter about COVID-19 or BC before it, after it. Kids are addicted to it. And a big question a lot of people ask me to ask you or I ask you is, how do you wean a child off of an iPad? Because what happens is for as active as my kids even are, when it comes down to it, the more you, the more they watch, uh, sc- have screen time, the more they want it, right? It's a really bad addiction. How do you break that addiction? By being accountable, period, as a parent understanding the importance of how you use the tool of the iPad so that it serves your kids to connect with their friends, it serves as part of their education for school, and it serves with a regulated amount of time, Mm -hmm. period, for video games that are age-appropriate. And let me tell you something, there are many parents right now that are sitting there going, "Mm, that's me, because... There's younger children playing games right now that are far too old for them mm-hmm. and then wondering why why their kids are not sleeping and having nightmares and thinking they're being hunted down, right, because they're playing stuff that's far too old for them. Right. And it's about responsibility and accountability and actually sitting there and being realistic and owning where you've been at. How many hours does your kid play a week? And what do they play during that week? And now how do we fill that space with the real things that they need to be doing that serves them every level, mentally, emotionally, and physically for their well-being? And then what time do we regulate that? So for me, the importance on an educational level of um, video games being played and the stimulation of any um, games before bedtime is a no-no. Because the body will not switch off. Mm -hmm. Mentally, it will not switch off. And physically, we're all hyped up. There is enough scientific data to show what that does to your brain activity as well as your blood, your, uh, you know, your, your, uh, uh, your Cortisol pulse, level, yeah. right? Exactly. Your rhythm, your pulse, and how hyped up you are before you even go to bed, right? right. So for me, it's a no-no. A good hour and 20 minutes before bedtime. 
you know? So getting into a bath time routine that is more conducive to being in a space that's going to unwind your body, period. Take your phones, take the tablets out of the bedrooms oh, and do yourself a oh, favor. Yeah. For all those parents right now that have a TV in their kid's bedroom, take it out. Why does TV need to be in a kid's bedroom? Put it into yeah. the communal rooms, you know? So again, have kids, kids, small kids have, t- you, you've seen that small kids have TVs in their bedrooms? Oh, gotcha. Oh, wow. I oh, mean, yes. Yes. I mean, that's not uncommon across wow. America. Really, it's very common. Wow. So, you know, you look at situations like that, like remove so that you can create an environment in the bedroom that's play or sleep, you know, so that the body can wind down. The problem is, and I'm going to say it, and people are not going to like it. Parents find excuses. Parents don't think it's a priority. And then parents call out and say, Joe, I need help. And I say, here's where we're at. How is it a priority? And it becomes about them. Well, I just need 20 minutes and I just need them to go to bed and I just need my evening. You get your evening when you first serve as a parent by giving the correct guidance of what your children need first. And then you will be rewarded with such because you did the right thing first by your child and you gave them what they needed. You Mm -hmm. gave them the opportunity to wind down through your guidance and through your parental guidance, whether the kids push back or not, in being able to set the guidelines and the regulation to do good for your whole family. And the problem is most parents don't want to upset their kids. They don't want the pushback. They don't want the argument. They don't want the resistance. So they just go, I give up. It's an easy way out. It's just basically just giving in. Yeah. You know, I see people always giving their iPad, like, you know, at dinner time. They don't want to deal with it. They want the kids to eat. So they put an iPad or a phone in front of them, which to me, I would think would be terrible, right? Uh, Why? It's, um, It's not just the conversation that happens around a table as a family, but it's an opportunity to, good, to teach good table manners. Exactly. It's, an it's an opportunity to talk to each one of your family members and, and converse around the socialization of the aspects of family coming together. It's also about food regulation. We eat twice as much when we're sitting there like eating, eating, watching, eating, eating. You can't hear the natural call of my body's full up. It's just yawn twice. You know, we need to, I'm full. So, you know, there are so many. There well, are people so do it, sorry, just in, in to, it, to interject. A lot of people I know, they put the iPad in front of their kids because their kids don't eat. So they put the iPad or the phone or a TV or a screen to make them eat. They, you know what I mean? So they actually are distracted by the television. Be the verbal television. You know, when children are very young, when, pe- when families are making the transition from puree food to food that's a little bit more lumpier, right, and parents get panicked because they think their kids are going to choke, yet right. they can eat a whole slice of dried toast and a, and a whole bag of goldfish, yet something soft they think they're going to choke on, yet they've had dry food throughout the whole day, right, <laughs> and they start, and every child does the, right, yeah. when they don't it and every parent goes we're gonna choke right so funny they put something in front of the child to distract and right we and well they were never going to pull the television were they off of the wall so back in the day the kids went in front of the television and ate at a little table or a high chair in the living room now we have mini TVs, we have phones, and we have iPads. So it's now miniature enough to come to the table, right? Right, right. So now they're putting it in front. But I say at that young age, um, distract your child. Talk about something else because if the focus becomes about the food, then they'll just play on it. I mean, look, I mean, I've seen, I've seen young adults, 20, 22, at a top table, at a wedding, holding their phone. Yes, okay. I know. On the right. edge. I went to Rome with my husband and sat with my family and husband. And I sat and watched a family of six, a family of six. And each one had the phone, a miniature uh, video gaming, um, an iPad. They all had something. We were in Rome. How do you spend a day as a wow. tourist? traveling around Rome and at dinner time 
not talking about what you've had to try and absorb because there's so much to absorb at dinner time. How, how do you... I know. It's amazing, you know, isn't it? It's amazing. And even, and even if, even if you're in a space of just, we need a moment, then that's fine. You know, that's what happens at the table. We have moments where we talk and then there's a couple of minutes where everybody's just eating and it's just quiet. And then somebody says, hey, did you see what was, oh, yeah, no, I remember. Oh, my friend told me, and it's another conversation. And then it's quiet and a little bit of eating. And we teach our children very young when we want them to finish at a decent pace. You know, we don't want a child taking an hour to eat a meal, but at a decent pace around sort of 30, 35 minutes. You know, we teach them how to do that. We talk and then we'll say, come on, let's eat some of our food now. You know, let's not talk anymore right now. Let's eat some of our food. And then we'll talk again. And then you food. And at the same time, we're saying, keep your mouth, you know, keep your mouth closed. Don't talk with your mouth full. You know, wait until you finish what's in your mouth and then you can talk because we're teaching good manners as well. So we're leading by example, hopefully at the table and by the manners that we instill so that we can teach our children um, a standard, you know, and a decent expectation of behavior and social conduct. And that's incredibly important in the primitive years. And if we can do so as parents, what we do is shape how they then behave once they get into those teenager years. Um, and by then, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that they are a credit to us, you know, as young teenagers in the way that they're able to conduct themselves and their behavior yeah. um, when they're at home and when they're out. That's not to say that we're not a little bit more informal at home but I still think there's etiquette and mm -hmm. standard of behavior that should be honored and should not be lost it's the ching in the wheel that's been lost when it comes to parenting and it's not been taught for a couple of generations and now it's lost you know and that needs to come back again what are some things that you could say in all of your 30 years that are the the tips, like the three no, the, the three no nos to do, and the three yeses to do. This there would be so many. Um, I know that's why I said three. How do you, which topic, which circumstance? That's what I was going to say because it depends on the age, right? But like, how about the age and the the age and the topic, um, and you know, um, the circumstance. Look, there's a mantra that I always mean what you say, say what you mean, but don't say it mean. Like, yes, uh, yes. Say, Mean what you say. Say what you mean, but don't say it mean. Don't say it mean. You know, it's, and if a lot of parents had cohered in understanding that, say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. You know, if they understood that, they probably wouldn't have got themselves into a lot of trouble. A lot you know, of trouble. they're now trying to untangle themselves out of, you know. Well, I, I do find that it's easier for someone, like people always say that kids don't listen to the parent as well as they listen to like an outsider, right? Like, a lot of times you probably have more, more success than the actual parent, maybe, maybe because the kid will listen to you more. What are the like, um, what? Oh, go not, ahead. Re not really. When I walk, in, when I walk into a home, there is a fresh standard. Okay. So, I mean, right. Okay. You know, when I walk in, there's the standard, there's an expectation. Right. I do have an expectation. Obviously, as somebody experienced in this field, I can balance what I notice, what I talk about and give the kids praise for. So, for example, if one child, um, if I'm working with one child and their parents over an issue, I will never forget to make sure that the other children are thanked for their patience. Mm -hmm. And in while we resolve a circumstance, I'm very mindful of every individual family member as I'm helping an entire family. So when I come in, there is a standard. Some of it is due to the fact that the older kids have already watched the Super Nanny shows. They've been on YouTube um, and they know I don't mix my words, even though I give out lots of, <laughs> although I give out lots of great hugs. They know when I mean it, I mean it, right? I'm, I'm firm, but I'm fair. So there's this moment of, you know, kids getting past the fact that parents have called me the new bogeyman. She's going to come. Nanny Joe's going to come here and then you're going to find out, you know, um, but they know with me that there's there's a give and take. They know there's a compromise. They know that they again is the firm, but fair, you know. Um, and they and kids want to show you that. 
They want to meet that expectation. They want to go, hey, look at me. This is the real me. Hey, I'm a great kid. Every kid's a great kid, you know, but the behavior can sometimes be undesirable in a space where it's caused a problem, not just necessarily the child because they're a teenager, an older teenager, but because of how the parents have behaved. So it's fresh with me. You have to remember with families, though, parents have seen the playbook for a long time with parents showing up a certain way. So in a way, they lose. They lose some respect and they lose the impact that they can make in a very Mm -hmm. positive way until they change their behavior. And when I can clean slate with older children like teenagers and teenagers, and I can have the parents recognize the patterns and where they've gone wrong, and to clean the slate by saying, look, it's a new day. You know, I am taking accountability for my own behavior as well. Uh, You know, Nanny Joe's here to change things. You know, I'm going to be listening to her. There are things I'm going to be learning myself. And this isn't okay anymore. And we need to change this and really work together as a family. Then what you see then is a moment of the behavior changing in the parent, a resistance from the teenager normally to say, do I trust you? Are you really going to do this tomorrow as well? But once the parent has been given the tools and the encouragement and the light bulb switches on, which I can tell you in 30 years, never never gets old. It's wonderful to see when it happens. And the penny drops and they're like, why didn't I do this before? What was I thinking? I'm like, don't beat yourself up. Let's just keep going. You right. know, for that family, the magic really does happen because through their own change in behavior, they've been able to change their children's, their families, and the impact of how they all move forward. And that percentage is incredibly high because when people call me, they really don't call me in for a cup of tea and a slice of cake. Right, right, right. You know, they call me in because I am the last chance saloon normally. You know, we've tried everything. We've done everything. Some have even been to therapists and psychologists and they say it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Or even they'll tell me, I've tried all your techniques. Nothing works, Joe. Nothing works. And I go, okay, let's start with the first one. Oh, oh no. No, I I didn't do that. Oh, but that's the step. Or, oh no. Well, I decided to tweak it a little bit and I decided to, oh, you decided to go off track. So you sabotaged yourself. So I'm able to backtrack with families, um, you know, their own, their own way of recognizing, follow the technique. It will never let you down ever. You know, what I teach families is tried, tested, and proven for three decades now, you know? So, and yes, every circumstance is different, as in family. They're unique. They're special. They're different to any other family. Their history is different. Their family dynamic is different. But child development is child development, you know? And because of my own life experience of working with families, I've been able to see it in all different ways, not just textbook. It's not, oh, the child walks and then the teeth come out. Because for some kids, they get the teeth before they walk, you know? So it's through the experience of being able to then look at a family and recognize that although they are special and very unique in themselves, they actually share universal issues and problems with many other families. And my job is to tailor specifically the uniqueness of the family to the universal challenge that they have and simplify what seems so complicated for them. And if I can do that for them and they get the results that they get and we use the power of television to capture this moment in time of a family, then it gives hope for every other family around the world because when they're watching, they can relate and say, well, actually, if the Joneses can do it, you know what? We need to do it as well because we, we just, that's us. Like, that's how I feel. Like, that's what you told me yesterday. Well, that's what they did. Well, that's what we're going to do, you know? And that's, that's the beauty of it's it. It's relatable. You know? Is there an age range that you work as your sweet spot? Um, not really. I mean, I've predominantly through the Super Nanny shows, 
have done younger children, you know, like teenagers down to babies. I started off working um, as as a um, you know as a as a nurse looking after. I'm not um, I'm not a nurse, um, but I started off looking after newborns when they came home. A baby, you know, nurse, like a baby nurse. So like, like a, a baby nurse. Yeah, like a night nurse. Or- yeah, I did that too. I did night nursing too. So, you know, they call it maternity nursing. You know, you have, um, you look after um, an, an infant, a newborn for the first six weeks. Um, and then normally the family may go on to then hire a sole charge nanny, um, on whatever those circumstances mm-hmm. are. But I started off looking after a lot of babies. Um, and then I moved into the toddler years um, and then progressed with being headhunted for challenges for many different types of ages of children, you know, um, into those teenage years. Um, but my own work and understanding and uh, I guess I would say makeup of who I am gives me the opportunity to be able to very intuitively connect with adults in their relationship and to profoundly, you know, look at each individual family member and to work how I will bridge the gap in not just resolving the issues through having the experience of doing so, um, but uniquely the impact that that makes to that particular family I'm working with. So predominantly you have seen me work with, you know, toddlers, um, you know, back in the day with different shows, but I actually work with teenagers, um, uh, you know, from sleeping to eating to um, a lot of now, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of marriage counselling, a lot of young, you know, a lot of young couples who are married, um, grandparents because they've become more involved with looking after the children, teenagers and addiction um, with the video gaming, um, even five, six-year-olds showing signs and symptoms of overuse in technology. So the gamut, my spectrum is very wide in my expertise um, in being able to help, you know, families and, and, you know, help them resolve many different challenges. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. it sounds like we were saying earlier, it's more that you're an ob- you observe behavior and what your forte is, is tweaking the behavior, not necessarily even just in the children, but it's a, it's much more about the adults or the, the, the combination, the, the dialogue dynamic between both, really. You know, it's me- I would say it's, I, I just, you know, it's three decades of observation and, you know, in the trenches, you know, the practical experience of helping so many different families in unique circumstances and challenges. But the makeup of who I am and the work that I do and how I connect with children is something to me that's been, is, is very innate, very... Yeah, natural for sure. Natural for me. Very, very natural. Um, and to be able to connect with um, those parents in their relationships with each different family members you know sometimes I'm helping families who have been estranged or um, you know parental alienation or how to help families co-parent under you know different strange circumstances blended families now uh, families who are what they call the sandwich generation you know the burnt out of the women in their 50s looking after younger children and elderly um, elderly parents as well you know Um, and it's not I don't put it into a box. Like it's just mothers, you know, it's just fathers, you know, it's parents, Parents, you know, whatever shape and form that, that turn, you know, that happens to be, um, it doesn't, you know, I, I work, uh, with the, um, you know, with the gay community, you know, and the importance of, of recognizing, uh, as a whole in breeding awareness that your sexuality does not define you as a parent, you know, but who you are as a parent and what you learn, and how I can educate you to help your family is what's most important in you feeling great on the journey that you have, you know? Um, Do you take private clients now or is it mostly just the TV show and the books and stuff? Um, I always have, yeah, I always have done. So um, you see me on camera helping families in the different formats that I've done um, throughout the years um, beyond Super Nanny, um, but also um, off camera, um, you know, I, to a private consultation for many families around the world. And that's done um, telephone or via Skype uh, for those consultations. Um, and right now, what I'm doing is providing public service for a lot of families. Right. So I have time to be able to, you know, 
in a very concise way if I can reach out and answer questions to those on Twitter or to those that come by joefrost.com to the website um, that write me an email and say, look, I really need help here. And then some will come through and say, um, you know, that they may have wanted a challenge resolved um, that they're going through or transition. And some um, even book me, which is rather delightful. Sometimes they book me for baby showers, you know. Really? Or, That's great. Yeah. Or sometimes families like mums will get together and want to do like a Zoom, you know, like 10 mums get together and say, right, let's, you know, let's talk to Joe. you know, let's, let's pick her brain on some stuff that we're all going through and be able to have what we're doing here really, but with more. Would you ever move into someone's house for a month, like in real time, like in real life, if some family, some like, I don't know, super rich family were like, you know what, I really want to use this lady for a month to really put my family, get to, to kind of like get my family in order. Would you do it? Um, it would probably be um, a very hard shot to try and get me for a month with the workload that I do have um, happening. Um Probably back in the day, it, it would have been uh, easier to do. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be that easy to grab me for a month now and be able to do that. But um, regardless of rich or notoriety or, or fame, you know, many uh, celebrity families reach out to me uh, for help because they're just like mum and dads, you know. And you know, most families are able to be able to work with me via Skype to be able to help them. You'll be surprised the amount of families. But think I need to be there, you know. Well, that's know. what I'm saying. Like a lot of people, a lot of people are like, "Oh my god!" Like I want this lady to live with me for a month, right? Because yeah, I've traveled. You know, I have traveled. I have, you know, I've I've traveled to London. I've traveled to Italy. I've tra- you know, I've traveled um, to families who want me to come over and do a consultation and to spend a weekend to be able to. But you know, most and in- most importantly. Regardless of your, um, regardless of your financial circumstance, for me, it's about the integrity of the work. You know, it's like, first and foremost, do you really need me there? You may think you need me there, but let's talk first. Let's, let's have a consultation. Let's work out, you know, where your challenges are right now, first and foremost, and let's see what we can do. And much can be accomplished through consultation and through the, um, you know, for the practice of being able to have those weeks of consultation and to practice the work that I'm giving you to actually do in the techniques, you know? Right. I would just because say, I would, right. I'm, I'm sure because I'm just saying your time is probably extremely valuable. You're very busy with yeah. the show and with everything else. Yes. That, that, that there is going to be like, real, like realistically, if someone wants you to live with them, it's going to cost, you know, a, a, a pretty penny. That's why I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a, a month, a month would never, you know. You don't need, you know, you you you, you wouldn't need me to move into your house. I think, or... I, I think that some parents that uh, are like so at their wits' end. I think I've been like, asked. I just think they'll mortgage their home for you. Never mind. That's what I'm saying. Rich or not rich, people would mortgage their home and put a third mortgage on their home. To, <laughs> I've, to been, get their... I've, you know, I've been asked. I just recently finished. You know, before the pandemic happened, I was helping a wonderful family. They're like, "Can you move in?" I'm like, you see? "Going to you." Join the queue. There's so many people asking, can you move in? You exactly. Yeah. Can I, I, I'm curious, what is the most um, asked question that you get? Like, what is, the, what is the most popular thing that people seem to ask you? Um, what do they ask? Uh, well, on a parenting level, you know, it's the, you know, it's the behavior, it's the sleep, it's the travel or sharing. On a personal level, what would they ask me personally? I don't know if there's any one particular. When I, first, yeah. when, I first came, when I first came to America, people would ask me if I was an actress. <laughs> really? Yeah, people asked me if I was an actress when I first came over, and I'm like, I was always like, an actress? Like, how are you going to act this? Like, are you kidding me? Like, no, you know, I'm, I'm a parental expert. I help families, you know. <laughs> Um, I'm curious how it's because you, you have kids, you don't have kids, right? No, no, you don't have kids. It's amazing. So how did you become such a global uh, phenomenon in this space of parenting? Right? Like what is you were a nurse, a maternal nurse? How did you become so good? Like, is it just innate? And you just kind of like get it on a on a deep level more so than the average? I mean, what is how I do you get it? I mean, I do get it. Yeah, on a, on a level that most wouldn't that there's no two ways about that and my experience 
you know, 30 years of experience gives you um, a lot of opportunity to be able to listen, to be able to help, to be able to, um, you know, pave way in being able to help families break the mold, create better habits, rituals, understand, bridge the gap between, um, you know, parent and child. And like I said to you before, the makeup of who I am anyway, you know, that allows me to connect with people the way that I do. But I started off um, as a professional nanny, you know, helping. Like I, like I told you, they call that name maternity nurse, but it wasn't for me because I'm not a nurse. Um, but I started off looking after babies. Um, and, um, you know, in that six weeks, that kind of first six weeks, of when newborns come home. Um, and I was a professional dedicated nanny. Um, and in doing so, it gave me the opportunity um, to work with different families. And from there, I was headhunted to resolve certain circumstances. And that led to phone calls. My, my, my um, father used to joke because back then we had house lines and he used to joke. Yeah, of course. You know, it's like, it's the, it's the nanny hotline. It's going again, you know, um, because families um, obviously would ask for help. And I've, I've always I've always loved children. As a child, I love children. I mean, I've always loved children. I love the work that I do. For me, it's very, um, very vocational, the work that I do. You know, it's a passion that is a tank that never, it's never empty. You know, my mind is thinking about the ways that I can help and making sure that I'm able to facilitate what the, what the families need and in order to do that you need to listen very well you know to what they're asking for um and from there i had an opportunity obviously to um to do the super nanny show and to pass with that um you know to to, to pass on that wisdom really and that expertise um and you know at that moment i recognized that there was an opportunity uh, for me to really help many families on a level that was phenomenal. And that's the power of television mm -hmm. when you can use it in a way that really has a positive impact. Um, and so the Super Nanny um, was incredibly successful. I, I had no idea, but when it went out, it was incredibly successful for Channel 4. And, um, Absolutely. You know, you know, I had no idea. And then I had the opportunity to come to America. And from then, you know, I was received. I, I've had... I'm so grateful because families are so grateful and I get the most beautiful messages and, res and you know, responses from families. There's so much love, you know. Sometimes you can come out of a house early hours in the morning and you're really tired and you've been on the road and somebody would have left a little note for you, you know, heard where you were and left a little note and it's just, you know, it's so warming, you know. And I'm very lucky. I've, I've been here for, um, I've been here since 2004 in America. Um, I go back and forth, to, you know, I did that going back and forth with England um, to do the show and, um, you know, to travel elsewhere around the world to do seminars, keynote speaking, uh, you know, the opportunity to write books, which was amazing. There's been so, so many amazing opportunities for me to be able to help families. Um, but I have to say, you know, most of all is is the is the love you know that I've received. You know, it's it's very touching for me and very humbling. It really is. You know, no matter where you've, I, you've helped so many families. I mean, I remember your show from years ago because even if your family's not like the family that you're on that that you're watching, you yes. can you could glean, you can actually learn something from a technique or from something that you're showing that you otherwise would never have known. And people love that ability, right? Like anybody who has children or in the space like that, to, you need to look to, upon people who are, you know, who are experts, who, are, who you can learn from, who are better than you and use their toolbox if things are not working, right? So, yeah, I mean, and just, and just conversations that I had, the reality of, you know, those conversations, even if you don't have children and you just love to watch the show, there's something that you can learn because, you know, it may be about the relationship between the, the dynamic two adults yeah. or the, the dynamic between the other family members, you know. And that's the, that's the beauty is being given the opportunity to actually use your experience and expertise to be able to help others. That for me is... That for me is the best thing, you know, that I'm able to do every day for so many families. 
and folk that what they are learning and what they are relating to and what they are inspired by, by watching those families who are so brave to ask for my help and to have two camera and two sound man, you know, with me in their homes, um, that they are not only just empowered themselves, but the bigger picture of what's being done here, the bigger picture of that is that that family in helping themselves just helped millions of millions. families without even knowing it, you know, how, right. how powerful in, in such a positive way is that? Like, to me, that's just, it, you know, just talking about it now, just having a moment of being present here, like, that's so, so powerful. It's yeah. so powerful to, to be able to, as a family, through your own hardship and emotional journey, you know, have the opportunity to also help another family whilst you're receiving the help yourself and being in a better space. So, you know, a big thank you to all of those um, families on all my different shows, you know, whether it's been Nanny on Tour, Super Nanny, Extreme Parental Gods, whatever the show is, family. So, you know, it's, there's been wow. several shows that I've done and, and um, produced. You know, the opportunity to be able to do that, it truly is. Uh, you know, it's beautiful, really. It's really beautiful. Are you having to, when you do these shows, how long are you living with the family that you're helping? Like how long is that whole episode? Like how long does that take? Is it like a? Uh, well, it all depends what the format is, you know. The new, the new one, the, the this yeah. one. The, the new mix. one right now is, um, I believe, we're around for ten days. Your ten days, but you don't so live with them. Before we're in the next. Um, if I have to be on their sofa, if I have to, you know, keep out on their sofas yeah. because there's different issues, then I will. Um, but no, I don't have to. I don't oh, you don't. To. It all depends what the circumstances are. And then can I ask you one question and I'll let you go because you've been so gracious with your time sharing. How do you get siblings to share with each other? You mentioned it a little bit and then we, we kind of got off that a bit. Um, how do you do that? What's, what's a good technique to use? Um, it's, the, it's the practice of being able to do it. So it's timed sharing. So again, we're in a moment where we don't have little ones around to play right now. So um, the sharing would come from the siblings. Um, if they're the same age, I think it's important to recognize that we quite easily buy two of everything. So I'd really encourage a parent to just do one of something, yeah. put one box with the crayons, and they all have to share and learn to put them back. Um, but really, we teach better sharing uh, when we're involved with our children and we're actually playing with them because then they can take turns and understand that it's my turn, it's your turn. Um, and recognizing that through the joy of sharing, which sometimes I do a technique where I ask each child to take something that's special of them in their bedroom and to give it to the other sibling to look after, mm -hmm. yeah, to show that there is a respect for looking after each other's belongings as well. So it comes in a whole package of having respect for your own belongings first taking care of other people's belongings and then the joy that comes from sharing and playing together. But it's within the practice of actually coming together with the children and teaching them first, taking turns, learning the rules of the games, um, looking at the opportunities where you bring your children together to have fun together and using one of rather than them all having one because, you know, a lot of parents have one each. Oh, I didn't want them to fight, so I bought them one each. Oh, really? A lot of toddlers, um, families who um, have twins or triplets, mm. um, they either have one of each or they have one. And so the kids learn pretty quickly. Right. You know? and, and then the story becomes making sure that the dominant twin or triplet is not the one who's the loudest getting everything all the time. But well, that's what happens in my house anyway, right? Like yeah. the, the more the more dominant alpha always wins the you know the, my older so one, my be, seven year old. So you have to be mindful of that, you know, because yeah. again, that kind of behavior only then teaches that this behavior gets them what they want. Exactly. Right? So again, if you can have one of something and teach them um, the importance of being able to you know recognize those rules and to recognize it again your children's own behavior, um, then on purpose, you give to the other child first. 
So I like that. It, yeah. it's quite interesting to observe yourself for a moment and be very present and go, well, how, how did I respond? You know, like I can sometimes help families with t- twins and triplets and they stick the one that's the loudest right next to them and feed them first. And I will right. change the dynamic and say, no, put yourself between them both and put the loudest further away because you did that to meet the needs of feeding and keeping them quiet, right? And now the one who's quiet has learned to be even more quiet because they feel invisible. So again, you take a relatable universal issue and then you uniquely tailor that to the dynamic of what the family is. Is it twins? It becomes very different to if it's like a nine-year-old and say a five-year-old, because again, sometimes a five-year-old wants to play with the nine-year-old's things, and the nine-year-old just wants to play with the Lego set on their own. They right. don't want anything to do with the younger child right now. You know, and then other times, you know, you can blow up a few balloons and punch them around in the garden, and everyone wants to play. Right, right, right. But you just made a very good point. You, you, you learn the squeaky, the squeaky oil, the squeaky wheel gets the oil in life, right? And it's true, the, the kid who is the more loud kid, the more dominant kid always seems to, so you give it to the opposite kid and teach that lesson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. Well, you've been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Uh, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, and yeah. you've, been, you've been great. Now, how do people find, like, where do people find you to get more information or to... So- so we have general parenting information, good for all, on joefrost.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, there's information always going on there. Then the Twitter is joe underscore frost, which I reach out. And sometimes I'm like, hey, I'm on, put your questions through, you know. And then on joefrost.com as well, you can go to where it says contact joe and you can reach out by email. Oh, okay. And my, um, my Instagram is Joe Frost. Easy enough. All right. So Joe Frost, Joe Frost, Joe Frost. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. You've been amazing. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet you face to face, but I guess this is the best. This is the next yes. best thing, right? Yeah. And much success to you and the, um, you. And the eighth season of uh, Super Nanny. And hopefully you get to film, start filming it again soon. Yeah, we're going to have to work out how we do that safely with the phases of, um, of California right now. I but know. When there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> yeah. you're you're the best. Uh, stay safe and uh, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Bye. Bye bye. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast powered by Habit Nest.